All right. Um, we've been talking a lot about paleolithic uh, nutrition, evolutionary medicine, but what most of us do is they have blogs and they do theoretical research. Well, that's of course interesting, that's uh, generating hypotheses, but what actually what needs to be done is there needs to be done uh, randomized clinical trials, and of course there needs to be basic knowledge, basic knowledge from where we come from. What do we know about paleolithic nutrition if we take a look at the place where we should take a look, where the paleolithic was, and during the paleolithic what was eaten? Um, well, as I told here, I'm also I'm going to tell you a lot about what I did during my research, during my PhD, but I'm also going to do some myth-busting. There's a lot of myth I've heard uh, these days, a lot of stories people told and things people were saying. Well, a lot of things I need that did need some uh, clarification. The first of is, uh, first is evolution is about reproduction. So after a successful re reproduction, life is useless. I've heard it several times during this symposium, but well, we, of course, we agree that the reproduction is, is very important and, uh, well, evolution is about reproduction, but there's more because it's not about only reproduction, as I, well, I asked this question to Dawkins once and he was laughing and he said, no, of course not, it's about the amount of offspring you have. The second step is that offspring needs to reach reproductive, uh, reproductive age to have offspring itself. And a last, uh, it needs to be fertile. Well, that's like called the grandmother hypothesis, the grandfather hypothesis. It has been tested in several um, species of monkey, of apes. It had also been tested in humans. Um, I know about one study in the Hazabi, but I also know, uh, know about a friend of mine, it's from Bodegom. He went to um, uh, West Africa and he did a similar study in several thousands of Africans, and he found that children who have a grandmother at time of their birth have a 2.7, um, oh, sorry, um, gr um, children, mothers that have, still have their mothers walking around have 2.7% more offspring. So that's an increase in offspring. That's an evolutionary advantage. Second, 80% of the children in this population were sired by a man over 50 years old. So that proves that after you reach, uh, after you have reproduced, you didn't reach the end of your life. You're not useless anymore. Even old people have their uses. They also bring evolutionary advantages to the rest of, well, their offspring. So let's get yeah. back to the. I'm glad I didn't know. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Tell that at home. Um, evolutionary medicine. Well, this is what we all know, of course. This is nothing new to, to you, everybody here. Of, of course, no, it's an equilibrium between our genes and our, in, our environment. And, well, diet is one of the uh, examples of the environment which we should, well, which is in some kind of optimal uh, equilibrium now with our uh, ancient genome. Well, what do we want to know? We want to know what was the composition of our diet during the Paleolithic and before. So if we have knowledge on that, we can, well, give advices on what we should be eating now to make this equilibrium or restore this equilibrium again. Well then, first we have to answer the question, and I think uh, Boyd Eaton was talking about it this morning, where did evolution of the human species take place? Well, we know that our last common ancestor with the chimpanzee was about six million years ago. Well, that's six million years, that's a lot. But Boyd Eaton was talking about 50,000 years ago, but he was of course talking about the Paleolithic and some ancestor which was living, well, 50,000 years ago. He could be living everywhere actually, because we had already left Africa. But I say we spent at least six million years of evolution in Africa. Well, that means since about 100,000 years ago we left Africa, 89% of evolution occurred in Africa. So if you want to say something useful about our Paleolithic nutrition, what we ate during the Paleolithic, we should go back to Africa, and especially to East Africa, the cradle of mankind. Well, I'm not the first who was thinking about it. Of course, Boyd Eden himself published about it in 1985. It was specific on this subject. He was talking about what were they eating in East Africa, and Cordain did the same. But actually, it was earlier already, in 1968, when Richard Lee and Irvin Devora, they organized a famous, well, symposium. It was called Man the Hunter, and he wrote some interesting things about it. Um, what did he say? Well. You can read it here. The general view is that gathering of plants and shellfish should be the most productive for hunter-gatherers, followed by fishing, and then 
while the hunting of mammals is the re least reliable source of food. Well, that's something else we have been hearing a lot here, especially some, some fitness talks were showing a lot of meat. Well, if that's the le least reliable source of food, maybe, well, should we call ourselves man the hunter? Well, well that was the story and the, the question this uh, Richard Lee also wanted to answer. So what did he say in the end? He estimated from this atlas, that is the, uh, on the previous slide, you saw the ethnographic atlas, that's an atlas containing well, all the world populations, including the Dutch, the, all the, the, the different Indians in, in Northern America, but all, every, every small population or small tribe on this world. Well, they extracted only the people who were not dependent on agriculture from that atlas, and they were investigating what percentage of, of yeah, what percentage in these people who only depended on either plant food, fishing, or hunting rely on hunting only. Well, he said, 35% of, uh, of the diet in worldwide hunter-gatherer uh, hunter society, societies derived from hunting. Well, that sounds plausible and that's still what's being used. However, and Cordain pointed this out, he said, because from 1968 on we said, okay, man the hunter, the, the myth has been busted. We were eating 65% plant foods. But yeah, probably you've been listening more clearly than most as, as the listener at that time. I was, tell, I was talking about plant food, I was talking about fished food and animal uh, hunted food. So actually Cordain said we should not be talking about 65% plant food because the other 35% is something else. And of course, well, I already told you that must be uh, derived from fishing. So only 30% derives from plant food 35% derives from hunting, and another 35 of subsist subsistence derives from fished foods. Well, we published this in 2010. It was me together with uh, Boyd Eaton, Mike, uh, Michael Crawford from England, and Lauren Cordain and my professor, Fris Muskeet. We published it in the British Journal of Nutrition in 2010. That it was like, it was, it was also very important to include fishing in our, um, our thoughts about what was our paleolithic diet. And then I wanted to add something else. Cordain also said the uh, scores that were in the uh, Man the Hunter book and in the Ethnographic Atlas were percentage of subsistence mostly by weight. But as everybody in this uh, audience know, knows is that of course if you eat meat and if you eat fat that contains more energy percent. So actually the numbers, the real dif uh, numbers might be a little different, but for general purposes also Cordain used these numbers, 30, 35, 35. So again, this is the picture that Boyd Eaton was um, showing to us this morning. And well, I was surprised that after he showed us a picture of the savanna, he showed us this, this, the shellfish. So I was wondering where did he find these shellfish on this arid savanna. Um, well, I can tell you if whoever has been in Africa knows that it's no, not all dry grass and not all savanna. Well, this is actually a lot of places in Africa, beautiful places, and especially, of course, in the Paleolithic, long time ago when there were uh, more dry and more, uh, more, more moisture periods, a lot of times Africa looked like this, and there was plenty of food, and, well, actually there were also more human species around than there are now. Um, so, I think the, ma the myth man the hunter has now a little bit been busted. This is only something that happened with the more recent Homo uh, sapiens, like 50,000 years ago, maybe 200,000 uh, years ago, but like two million years ago, most of the plan or most of the food was not hunted, but it was for a large part derived from gathering plant foods and gathering fish or hunting fish. So we could better be talking about man the gatherer. This is actually a picture from Australian Aboriginals at the, at the moment that the first explorers were arriving there. Men were collecting oysters and, and mussels and stuff like that on the beach. Um, so there's additional evidence. The probability of a kill in a bushman is only 23%. So you could say hunting is very important for those people. Yeah, that's true. They talk about it all the time. If you go to a campfire, they will be talking about the hunting, but 
that is because hunting is important for them and of course they like most the food that's deriving from hunting but it's no, not their primary source of food. The probability of a kill is only 22% so a long period of the other time they're probably running for elephants instead of catching them. So in this case also if the men are running for the animals it might be women together and you can also imagine the arid savanna is much too dangerous for the woman and especially for a child and especially for a, a pregnant woman. So a much easier place for women to collect their food is on the beach and that's what you see also if you go to Africa. Women can collect both plants, stranded fish and shellfish and even with their children. Um, so let's back to the case. Um, we ate at least 35% food. That's what the ethnographic atlas is telling us, what, what actually Man the Hunter was already telling us, but it was not interpreted right. So I was looking for additional evidence. Is there more evidence that we derived a, 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 a significant proportion of our diet from fish? Is there archaeological evidence? Is there isotopic evidence? And I will tell you about it more. Or is there more evidence from human physiology and epidemiology? Well, first, archaeology. Very difficult to interpret. Why? Because the sea level has risen over 150 me meters in the last 70,000 years. So all the places where we live close to the sea, well, you can go there, but you have to wear uh, diving stuff and you have to be 100, 100, 150 meters deep. People are actually doing this. They are trying to uh, do archaeological, uh, find arche archaeological stuff under the water. But yeah, it's very difficult. But there are some places, for example, caves, which used to be at the very close to the water, which are now, well, they are under the water, but at somehow there are some caves which are, uh, have gone up now, and that's, for example, in South Africa, and they have been finding a lot of archaeological evidence that people were using um, um, aquatic resources. Actually, if you take, a, and that's the, well, we are fortunate that, of course, a lot of lakes inside, the water level has remained more constant, um, and what we see is that the oldest evidence for the exploitation of aquatic resources, resources dates from about two million years ago in Lake Turkana. Well, I've written a review about it and you can see it in the, on the right uh, bottom corner. Um, there's actually much, much more evidence for use of aquatic resources. There's a lot of fossil evidence, there's a lot of just uh, shells, there are shell middens, a lot of bones from aquatic animals which have been, which have been used by, by humans. So the evidence is there, there's clear evidence, even use of more sophisticated ways of hunting date uh, from only 90,000 years ago. Zaire, there have been, there have been found uh, harpoon points, there have been found fishing hooks. And if you go back to seafaring, they have found canoes f uh, that were dated 42,000 years ago, but there's also fossils from, uh, from Flores, that's near Indonesia. They have found human fossils on Flores Island. Well, the people who have been there, maybe not so many, but there's a very deep sea strait among the, the mainland and Flores Island, which is about five kilometers wide and about five kilometers, or five, three, two, something like that, kilometers deep. And if all the water is getting through, it's very strong current. So it's impossible, it's like nobody has ever made that crossing swimming. So it's impossible to imagine how these people those Homo erectus actually it was, so they are like one million year old or several thousand, 800,000 years old, they assume. How could he cross this sea street without, well, basic knowledge of how to navigate the sea? Well, they didn't find any eviden evidence, but the, the evidence that that guy was living there is somehow evidence. So they are not yet, yeah, they didn't yet find out how he, how he got there. But a two kilometer deep reef seems to be a very difficult obstacle you could only cross by navigating. Well, we know about the out of Africa diasporas. Well, this is the out of Africa diaspora and you see that almost, well, almost all of the coasting out of Africa occurred along the coast. People were following the coast. They always used the water to move out of Africa. And this is, that's not a coincidence in my opinion. Those people use the aquatic resources for basic life. Like I was telling you, hunting provided only a 23% success. So it was like, as, have been, as has been told by other researchers, shellfish and fish were like their butter and bread. It was their basic food. They weren't even talking about it. I was in Africa and people told me we were eating vegetables. And when I 
was invited to their dinner, they gave me fish. And I said, I said, this is not a vegetable. And they said, yeah, but it's basic food for us. We call it a vegetable. It's so common. Well, imagine how it was happening that time. There was more. People were eating fish and shellfish all the time. It was their basic food. Hunting was, of course, more important for them. But it doesn't mean nutritionally more important in amounts. It was in their head, and it was, yeah, it was not in the amounts that it was more important. Well, then isotopic evidence. Maybe if, well, most people here have probably read this article. It was in Science last year, uh, written by uh, Ungar and uh, Mats Sponheimer from South Africa. And tho those guys do a lot of isotopic um, ratios on, on fossils. And by comparing these isotopic ratios, they try to find out what people were eating. Well, there's one isotopic ratio which is interesting, in my opinion. It's the C3 and the C4. C3, well, it's something they measure the, the ratio between those two in bones. It's very difficult, but I, I, I can explain it shortly. Uh, C3 is typically from uh, bushes, uh, forests, uh, trees, and stuff like that, while C4 is typical for savanna grasses. So because we were thinking we derived from a chimpanzee-like uh, creature, we would be eating most C3 plants. That is because that's the fruits and that's all the leaves that you can find in the, in the, in the rainforest. But when they did the analysis, um, sorry, when they did the analysis, they saw that our, the values they found were somewhere in between for C3 and C4. So, well, that proved either that our ancestors were eating grass, C4 grass, or they were eating part of their diet from other animals that were eating C4 grasses. But, well, after some uh, discussion, they said, well, that's, that's quite difficult. How can those early hominins uh, uh, catch, for example, buffaloes and zebra on the savanna? Because these were the Homo erectus a few mil million years ago. Well, then they found another option, and they said, maybe it's termites. Well, that is, for what I have found, is the latest option they have found for the, the outcomes of their research. But we did a more extensive research on the same subject. This is the ratios you can find for our uh, ancestors. And here you see the termite. So their isotopic ratio, it's called their isotopic uh, footprint, is closest to termites. That's the only thing they said. They hypothesized it's close to termites. What they also said is maybe we have been eating a mix of C3 herbivores, so that's um, herbivores in the forest and a mix of, of C4 uh, herbivores. Where's the C4? Here. So if you have a mix, you mix this one with this one, you might end up somewhere in between. Well, that's also a possibility. That's the possibilities they were giving us. But as you do a more extensive literature research, what we did, we did a review, you, see all, you also see that uh, freshwater fish, marine mammal hunters, um, crustaceans, freshwater fish, fish gatherers, freshwater carnivores, all those fish-eating animals are very close to the ratio we found in early Homo. But for some reason, especially the archaeologists, do not want to believe that we were possibly eating fish. Well, actually, the ethnographic atlas showed us 33% was deriving from fish, or 35 So I don't know, well, nobody really knows why it's did this way. I contacted Matt Sponheim, and he said, well, we will take it under investigation. And that was, well, a year ago. <laughs> Um, well, there's more about epidemiology and pathophysiology. What does the aquatic environment uh, provide us more? It's uh, some very important nutrients. Ben Balser had a poster presentation yesterday about iodine and brain development, how important it is for brain development to, to consume enough iodine. Uh, it's related to IQ. Um, well, iron, we've been hearing a lot about iron today. Iron is also very important. Selenium, well, I haven't heard a presentation about it, but it's also very important for us. Um, not to mention vitamins A and D, and of course, omega-3 fatty acids. Moreover, DHA is the most important uh, fatty, acids in the human, uh, fatty acid in the human brain. So, um, well, we had the discussion with Lauren Cordain, and um, he had a paper about it some years ago, and he said LCP for brain expansion, because DHA is uh, very abundant in the brain, it could also derive from a uh, scavenged brain. Well, um, that's possible, of course. But as most of you know, well, if you, you can imagine, 
who needs most of the LCP for a developing brain? That's not the man scavenging on the savanna. That is the pregnant woman who is not scavenging at the savanna, who is waiting at her husband at home. And especially the infant who, is, who has his uh, brain spurt just uh, shortly after birth also needs a lot of DHA. So either they go on the savanna, which is unlikely, which has not been proven in present hunter-gatherers, or those men have to bring back those um, LCP. Well, that's a blubbery brain all those kilometers from the place where they scavenge an animal. Well, I have heard a story about a long-distance runner from Professor Lieberman, but I'm not sure if they were experienced in long-distance running with a blubbery brain in their hands. <laughs> um, well, but what is the solution? Again, women can uh, collect shellfish, can collect fish at seashores, at lake shores, and those are also very rich source sources of omega-3 and LCP. So what we did is, uh, in the paper I was already talking about with Ethan Crawford and Cordain, we made an, a model for um, what if we include 33% aquatic foods in a paleolithic diet. Well, we used some constraints for that model because, of course, well, it has been said before, 35% of uh, protein is, is, is a minimum, is a maximum uh, level. Uh, linoleic acid, LA here, means uh, it's, there it is, there. It's, uh, it should be at least 1% of energy. And, well, we said it can only be locally available uh, foods, so foods from the East African ecosystem. Um, the plant animal ranges we range between 30 and 70, uh, but uh, the amount of fish and animal with, uh, within that models could range from 0 to 100%. So where did we end up with that? Well, actually it was quite the same, and maybe some of you have read the paper. It's the last uh, um, assumption, or the, the last uh, estimation we made of a Paleolithic diet with Cordain. It's about the same numbers you know from his earlier papers. The only thing is we, we now included long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. And the interesting thing was, was, in these diets, they were consumed in gram amounts. Well, that's a little bit different from what we are advised by the, uh, by the nutritional boards nowadays. And the second thing is that linoleic acid was very low. So, well, the interesting result, and we wanted to prove this in Africa, was we had high LCP intakes and very low linoleic acid intakes. But what does the facts from the floor tell us? So we went to Africa. This is what I did. I drove my car all the way from Cape Town, well, finally back to Amsterdam, but we did a lot of stops. We were looking for hunter-gatherers. Well, these guys, of course. But, um, yeah, I am uh, mid-busting today, so I can tell you those guys are not here anymore. I found some, and they said, I can redress for you if you pay me. <laughs> yeah, so probably his food wasn't that traditional either. So we <laughs> continued. We went from South Africa, where we, or this is from uh, Botswana actually, where we m met this guy, not these guys. We went further on to Tanzania, and in Tanzania, we had the same problem. The Hadzabi, they were, well, they were living traditional, but they had every tribe had their own uh, um, anthropologist, and they had their own food supply from local tourists, and if it wasn't food, it wasn't, it was alcohol. So we had a lot of difficulty finding real traditional people. So in the end, we decided we'd try to find people who show parts of a traditional lifestyle. So, for example, the pastoralists, some agriculturists, they practice agriculture, but they're still eating a lot of local fish from the local lakes. The same for hunter-gatherers. They also have some, well, natural traditions. For example, they walk around, well, half naked, who has ever seen uh, the Hazabi. Um, so, from this combination of tribes in Africa, we try to uh, reconstruct our paleolithic diet. Well, for example, we collected milk samples. I, we did two papers on that, and you can see that's a lot of people. Um, for, this was for examination of the amount of fish. Like I told you, 35%, we wanted to prove that. So we used uh, DHA as a proxy for fish consumption. And what we saw is that, I shall start with DHA, indeed, in the popula populations where we sampled, we found very high uh, contents of DHA in the milk, proving that they were eating a lot of fish, and also that's well, it's physiologically po possible to have very uh, high concentration of DHA in the milk just by eating it. The other thing was, in, and that were only a few tribes that were not yet using cooking oil for frying or for whatever, and those people indeed had very low concentrations of lin linoleic acid in their milk. Um, so, what this, this is another myth. Um, we saw that paleolithic intakes of linoleic acid were very low, not only from the reconstruction, as I showed you before in the paper with Cordain, but also proven by the 
milk of the people who were not yet eating vegetable oils. oils. Well, nevertheless, the, the American Health Association is advising us to consume over 10% of linoleic acid. So, well, that's not really in, uh, the same as a paleolithic diet contained, probably. Well, that's what I was talking about at the Congress with a friend of mine, Chris Remsen, and he said, he did a meta-analysis on the subject, and he said, do you know where the uh, uh, recommendations from the American Health Association derive from? He said, they derive from studies which have been performed with PUFA. That's a combination of alpha-linoleic and linoleic acid. And he excluded all the studies that contained both of these, and he showed that if you were just eating more alpha-linoleic acid, that's also a PUFA, then indeed you had a lower cardiovascular disease risk, while you, while you only uh, uh, the, took the linoleic acid trials, you actually had a borderline higher risk of cardiovascular disease. So these recommendations from the American Heart Association are quite biased by using well, the wrong studies to say something about linoleic acid, while you actually used a combination of alpha-linoleic and linoleic acid. Well, that's an important uh, uh, difference. Um, well, as most of you know, also the high, the present uh, high intakes of linoleic acid interfere with the, uh, the, the chain elongation from alpha linoleic acid to its long uh, chain uh, uh, metabolites, EPA and DHA. So that's another disadvantage of eating these high amounts of linoleic acid. So this myth is also busted. Linoleic acid, for me, is not healthy. Um, so what did we do further? We also collected more strong uh, status parameters. Besides milk, we collected erythrocytes from these people from the different locations I was showing you. Well, that's what we did because we wanted to show the difference with the physiological um, pregnancy in Western countries. Well, what do we consider normal in a Western pregnancy? Um, for everybody, well, most people probably won't know, but biomagnification means that if you take blood from the mother and her child at uh, delivery, you will find that the infant has a higher uh, erythrocyte DHA status compared to his mother. Well, in other words, the infant is more important during pregnancy. It uh, attracts all the DHA, it, it's, how do you say, it, it eats all the DHA from its mother. So the mother will deplete during pregnancy and actually, during um, it said, um, well, sorry, this is the infant. The infant, it should not be during pregnancy, it should be during lactation. So what I was saying is, biomagnification is not normal, if it's normal in a Western pregnancy. Well, the mother depletes her DHA stores during pregnancy and during subsequent lactation. And what you also see is, despite the depletion of the mother, the infants in a Western pregnancy still deplete their DHA stores during lactation. Is that normal? Well, in Western countries, we consider that as normal. Well, we do a lot of supplementation studies, but they are based on, well, outcomes. They're never based on depletion. If you look at the studies, they didn't look at what happens to the actual status. Well, we did that, and what we saw is that in those African people with the high intakes of fish, you saw a few differences. First of all, deliv at delivery, the African women with high fish intakes had higher erythrocyte DHA status compared to the infant, so no biomagnification. The mother is still higher, while here the mother is lower compared to the infant. Second, um, infant erythrocyte uh, DHA status, so the, her, that's a proxy for the DHA status in general, increased after delivery. You can see it here. The infant goes up, while in Western pregnancies the infant and the mother go down. And last of all, what we saw is that the decrease in the maternal erythrocyte status here, this is in almost vegetarian, um, well, semi-malnutritioned um, African mothers, the DHA status increased a lot. While in Western pregnancies, it also decreased, but less. But what you see is it gets even less. The decrease is still less in those African women with not even that high, but quite high intakes of DHA. So what we could calculate, and we published that in the Journal of Nutrition, is that if you, well, if you go any further, for example, you say if you eat more fish, what status should you have not as a mother not to decrease your DHA status? Well, that was eight. Well, remember the eight. Because DHA is associated with, with more um, uh, diseases and more uh, things, such as um, post and peripartum depression. It's connected to infant neurodevelopment. It's connected to psychiatric disorders. 
is connected to fertility. For example, if you look at sperm, sperm has a long tail, that's why it swims so fast. I heard during lunch some woman talking about fertility is very important, so I was thinking, oh, I have to add this. Sperm is swimming more quickly when it contains more DHA. That's an well, interesting detail. And of course, cardiovascular disease, myocardial infarction, and antiarrhythmic effects of DHA are very well known. And last of all, inflammation with the metabolic syndrome. What is the role of DHA in inflammation? I will tell you shortly. First of all, um, cardiovascular disease. What did we see? This is a study by Harris. It's the same guy who did the American Health Association recommendation for linoleic acid, but whatever. He also did a study on DHA, which I do trust. And that's like if you had a very low DHA status, that's the fish oil, you had a very high, well, it was normalized to one, but as soon as your status increased, the risk of getting cardiovascular disease increased very, very significantly. This is about 25%, so from one to 0 0.25, that's a big inc a decrease in cardiovascular disease risk. And even if they compared it to other risk factors, Look here, this is HDL, this is LDL, this is CRP. The biggest risk reduction you receive by monitoring your DHA status. So why is everybody talking about CRP, inflammation, DHL, LDL, TG, uh, the ratio, even uh, homocysteine? Well, the most important, well, in my opinion, a very useful risk marker for getting vascular disease would also be monitoring your DHA status. It's very easy. Well, the, the method is not that easy, but it's, it's a very good marker for, the get, for evaluating your risk of cardiovascular disease. So, the second thing, psychiatric disorder. Um, Horobin wrote, wrote a book about it. Um, psychiatric is closely connected to, to DHA, and they also saw the lowest incident of, uh, incident of, of uh, major depressive disorders and bipolar disorders from a DHA status of 7 gram percent, like a little bit lower than the 8, but still. Um, and then inflammation. What did we see? We collected thousands of samples from African people. We collected thousands of samples from Dutch people, from Caribbean people. We collected a lot from malnutrition, um, well, it was Pakistani and Israeli children. And what you saw is there was a parabolic, like a, like a, a, a this shaped, what is it? The shape of curve between DHA and AA. Well, most of you will know. Um, I lost my red thing here. DHA and AA. AA is known as uh, pro-inflammatory, and DHA is known as anti-inflammatory. So what you saw in those women, because well, in this example we only collected blood from women, you saw that their increasing DHA status decreased their concurrent AA status. So that might be the pro-inflammatory reaction was suppressed by the anti-inflammatory DHA, which was, which was high in the, those women. Um, well, I will be quickly about this. Um, we also collected, um, to say something about neuro neurology, we co collected brain from uh, infants who had diseased during uh, delivery, and we found in these uh, children, we found lower uh, DHA status and higher AA status compared to Western women, well, quite as, of, as children, as expected. We made movies of their children. We, we made uh, hundreds of movies just to observe the movement patterns in these children. The, we put them on their back, as you can see here. We made a movie about uh, 15, 20 minutes, and we were, their movements were observed by a uh, pediatrician who was experienced in this, and they found that the DHA status in these infants was collected with the complexity of their, um, of their movement patterns. And well, there's another study which shows that, especially in the precentral uh, uh, cortex, here DHA status is very high. So DHA might be connected to motor uh, complexity. So it, 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 well, it makes sense what we found. Well, finally, vitamin D. Uh, we measured vitamin D in traditional people because we are always talking about vitamin D. What should be the optimum levels? Well, nobody knows. Why? Because we only measure in people who are sitting indoors all day. And even if you go to Africa, most people are dressed now. But as we will all agree, during the Paleolithic people are either not wearing anything or just some, well, scarce animal cloth. Well, this is the people we were sampling, Hadzabi. They are very black, but, well, most of the day they walk around, just they, they don't have houses or they don't have, well, there's some shelter, but, you, you, well, they, they participated. And another group is the Maasai. We collected 
um, blood samples from these Maasai, and well, it, 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 of course it doesn't surprise you, but there wasn't hard evidence until yet. Nobody had done this study to simply measure vitamin D levels in traditional hunter-gatherers, and well, well, this is the median, it's 120 and 110, it doesn't surprise you, but of course the conservative societies in Europe were like, ooh, this is toxic. <laughs> well, I'm not sure. I only know that the Dutch Health uh, Council advises 30 nanomol, so that's a lot lower, for women under 50 and men under 70, and well, above these age it's only 50 nanomol, and well, actually the IOM, the Institute of Medicine, says the same, 50 should be perfect. Well, that's a big difference with our ancestors. Um, is there some proof that, that, that is, there's a problem with calcium? Well, from 80 already, there's no increase in calcium absorption, so it won't be too much. So the only problem is how can we reach these ancestral levels? Well, in Holland we have a problem because we calculated that you need to have intakes. Well, our baseline levels in Holland, where there's not a lot of sun, especially not in the winter, are between 20 and 40, which, according to our uh, local health uh, committee, is perfect. But if I would say my, my status is 20 or 30, and I want to increase it to 80, which I assume is better, I should eat an oral dose of 55 micrograms. Well, that's not allowed. In the Netherlands, our upper level advised by this health institute is only 50 micrograms. Interesting. So we can't even eat enough to have ancient levels of vitamin D. So my conclusion is, our ancestors had high DHA status, high vitamin D status, and low linoleic acid status compared to current Western societies. And I think that while we saw a lot of risk factors here, which are, well, related to all kinds of ingredients and nutrients and macronutrient compositions, why don't we include the omega-3 index, EPA plus DHA? It has been, well, like the figure I showed you, it, it has a very good correlation with cardiovascular disease. So I suggest we should include that, and I think that long-term intervention studies are needed to confirm the beneficial effects of the uh, nutrients I'm talking about, DHA, vitamin D, and LA, but they need to be performed with a concurrent appreciation of other factors that have changed since the start of the agricultural revolution, and notably the industrial evolution. And what I mean is, if you do an intervention trial, you can give people DHA only or vitamin D only, but we have changed a lot, so like the vitamin A, intervention studies which showed increased cancer rates, well that doesn't tell us that vitamin E is unhealthy, it does tell us that we never ate vitamin, T, uh, vitamin A only when we were eating. You eat a banana and you eat a fish, so actually if we want to study the, the health effects of these nutrients we should include the knowledge we have now that vitamin D was high and, and DHA was high in the uh, advisement like the studies um, that Stefan Lindeberg is doing to include all the ingredients we need to eat more in a study and then look at the final outcomes. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? I think we have time for about one question in case everybody has one. You mentioned the omega-3 index as a great uh, predictor. I can't hear you. All right. You mentioned the omega-3 index as a great predictor of cardiovascular disease risk. Um, and that's connected both to how much you consume, but since it's also easily destroyed by oxidative stress and, uh, and a lot of negative health conditions, you lose uh, omega-3. Um, so it, it may not be quite as easy to repair that uh, biomarker as but I think uh, everything you said about uh, fish consumption and diet. Okay. Uh, I wonder if you have thought about uh, if, if you have looked in this, the literature on omega-3 uh, yeah. index and uh, dietary steps to improve it. To improve it, yeah. Well. I have looked, yeah, the question is, have I looked into literature if there's any way to improve your uh, omega-3 index? Well, of course, there's eating fish, but most fish are not that rich in DHA, so you have to eat fatty fish. And well, the amounts, that also depends on the person you are, because they have, well, actually there seems to be a strong selection, uh, selection pressure on the ability to make uh, omega-3 fatty acids, but further proves me that 
living in an aquatic environment and eating aquatic resources is important because our genes are very well adapted. They have been selected to um, be able to convert alpha linoleic acid to longer chain met metabolites, but there are uh, big differences between individuals. So I could say to one person you should eat two times of fi uh, fish a week is enough for you to reach eight uh, gram percent of DHA, but for others they could have to eat could have to eat it like daily. So, well, at least two times fatty, ish, uh, fatty fish a week is what my society, also the International Society for Fatty Acid and Lipid Research, recommends to reach a status of, well, it's not really a status. They say 500 milligrams a, uh, a day should be advised. That's the recommendation. So two times fatty fish a week. Great, everyone. Please thank Remco once again.